This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. This is Stacey Clardy from the Salt Lake City VA and the University of Utah. Today on the Neurology Podcast, we're joined by Brian Stam and Bainam Sabayan. Brian is a vascular neurologist at the University of Michigan, and Bainam is a vascular neurologist at the University of Minnesota and also works at the Hennepin Health Research Institute. We're going to talk about their paper that was published in Neurology Clinical Practice on Splenium Lesions. The title of the paper is Diffusion Restricted Lesions of the Splenium, Clinical Presentation, Radiographic Patterns, and Patient Outcomes. So Bain and O'Brien, when I saw the title of this paper, I guess I really can't say it any better than your opening line to the paper where you wrote, diffusion restricted lesions of the splenium are encountered in a wide variety of pathologies and their significance is often unclear. So whenever I see one of these lesions in a patient, I kind of take a deep breath. It's a little bit daunting for me to know where to start to figure out what's going on and what I need to do to hopefully prevent worsening. So I got to ask you, what made you want to do this? Basically, this study, the idea of starting this project kind of started when I was a senior resident in the ICU consult service. And then we've got like three back-to-back consults about patients with different stories that turn out to have kind of similar lesions on the MRI. And the long story short, the consultant was a curious and very dedicated intern that turned out to be a neuro-intern. And that was Brian. Um, so I and Brian, we said that this is really interesting to see these three different patients at the same time have renal lesions, diffusion restriction. And that was a night nice for starting to think about what should we do about these patients? How they represent a wide variety of etiologies. And that was the starting point for us to gather more data write a small grant and kind of get the funding to do this research in our institute at the time. Wow, that's a great story. And you're both vascular neurologists. So that tells me that it's not just me who has to sort of pause when I see these lesions. So before we dive into the relevance and everything you've found, Brian, can you just back up, give us a quick neuroanatomy refresher? Where is the splenium relative to the entire corpus callosum and the rest of the brain? So the splenium is the posterior most portion of the corpus callosum. So going in order from anterior to posterior, you've got the rostrum, then the genu, the body, the isthmus, and finally then the splenium. The reason that we focus specifically on the splenium in our study was what Benham just mentioned, but also that this region of the corpus callosum has an excess of neurotransmitter receptors, which makes it selectively vulnerable to cytotoxic injury and diffusion restriction from a variety of etiologies. Interesting. So you looked, if I got this right, at your center from 2009 to 2020, and you took all the MRI reports that mentioned a corpus callosum lesion with diffusion restriction. And that was a lot of reports, but you narrowed it down. Looks like you excluded patients with a prior neurosurgical procedure, patients with a hemorrhage associated with their diffusion restrictions, or anyone who had anoxic brain injury or a chronic or previously known or characterized disease process that is known to affect the corpus callosum. And that still left you with 200 patients, correct? That's correct. Okay, great. So what were the most common causes of the lesions in those 200 patients in your cohort? And and if you could also tell us what were some of the relevant demographics of of who was left in that group of 200 patients? We had a very diverse group of patients in that cohort. The average age was 57, but with a standard deviation of 19 years, which tells us that it covered young adulthood, middle age, and older age. About half of the patients were female, and then we had about 57% of population was white, but also we had a good representation of the black, Hispanic, and a small portion was Asian population. In addition to the demographic factors, one interesting finding for us was the reason for initiation of the imaging and maybe consultation for neurologists. And the most common presenting symptom was encephalopathy. I know many of us as neurologists, we are always excited about 
consults with reasonably encephalopathy, but <laughs> that was actually one of the major findings. And then also a significant portion of patients had some focal uh, symptoms or um, cortical signs like apraxia, neglect, agnosia, and even aphasia. And one other finding for us was that the most of the lesions were asymmetric and you know the neat bilateral lesion that we always think about it for these type of lesions was not necessarily present in most of those cases. The most common diagnosis or etiology for the splenial lesions were uh, by far vascular uh, lesions and it followed by malignancy and then the next group um, were those who were related to trauma or toxic metabolic lesions or clock that we always think about it. So that was interesting to see that actually the most common etiology was vascular. And we had like a differentiating features. For example, if a patient on a vessel imaging had disease or a patient had cardiac uh, abnormalities or high predictive probability for uh, cerebrovascular risk factors, that turned out to be more predictive of vascular lesion versus if a patient had enhancing lesion or mass effect lesion would be more malignancy. Whereas if a patient had just uh, exposure to toxins or uh, metabolic processes, it turned out to be more clock. And of course, trauma had that prior history. So the second most common was malignancy. And, and by that, do you mean a primary central nervous system malignancy and that's what you were seeing in the splenium or associated to systemic malignancy somehow? Most of them were primary malignancies, uh, either gliomas or it could be lymphoma uh, that involved the brain. Okay. And you mentioned the acronym CLOCK, which if I'm remembering correctly, that means a cytotoxic lesion of the corpus callosum, right? C L O C C. And can you tell us how are those cytotoxic callosum lesions different than, say, your overall category of splenium lesions, sort of generic or all encompassing? Do these patients have other lesions along other parts of the callosum, or does it sort of matter to get this clock designation how big the lesion is? Tell me a little bit more about the subset of these splenium lesions that you call clocks. Patients who did not have clock, but they had vascular lesion, they tend to have multifocal lesions. They tended to have lesions that were associated with a disease in a specific vascular territory, for instance, or they had other signs of malignancy in other parts of the brain, or imaging features like mass effect or enhancement. Patients who had clock, they were those that tend to have better prognosis, and they were the one that had more often resolution of the uh, splenial lesions in the follow-up MRI as compared to the other patients. Okay, so if I'm going to get a splenium lesion, I probably want a clock is what I'm taking away from this. <laughs> and I don't want the edema and all the other things. Um, Brian, I want to go back to you since you, you were the intern that started all this trouble for this project. So in the cohort, how did all these patients do on follow-up? For some of them, was this a one-time hit, a monophasic process, or do these patients tend to do poorly in the long run? What should I be thinking about when I get consulted in terms of the entire picture for this patient? It was really kind of the impetus for us uh, doing this study in the first place. When Benham and I had those initial cases when I was an intern, we realized there was a relative lack of literature on outcomes for patients with splenium diffusion restriction. So in our cohort as a whole, basically we found that the in-hospital mortality occurred in 8.5% of cases. And nearly half of our entire cohort, so that's all of the 200 patients had a hospital readmission within a year. Wow. Overall, these outcomes were worse than what we were initially anticipating. Likely, this is due in part to what Benham was mentioning, you know, the predominance of vascular lesions, malignancy as etiologies that are persistent or progressive etiologies, and a relatively lower frequency of the clocks or the lesions that more typically would reverse. We had more of the persistent or progressive lesions in the cohort, and so that may have played a factor in those worse outcomes for our cohort. We did also find that patients with clocks had less frequent readmissions at one year compared to those without clocks. That's really useful, right? Because again, if, if we don't figure out what's going on here, the first time we're consulted on a splenium lesion patient, 
chances are we're going to get called again because about half of them are being readmitted, right? So we really do have to get this right. And we have to figure it out, I think, while they're acute. I would agree. And so you gave me the big categories. Did you pick up on any things that were characteristic of conditions we shouldn't miss, but maybe aren't that common, you know, anything genetic or were there any SUSAC patients in there? Was there anything that you can tell us as sort of a tip or a pearl, like, by the way, if you see this, go down a a different diagnostic pathway, any of that? SUSACs is one of, you know, as a vascular neurologist, one of my favorite diagnoses to try to make. We actually did have two patients in the cohort with SUSAC syndrome. So we did have a couple of those. There were some other particularly interesting and rare etiologies as well that I could mention. We had a patient or two with PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. We did have a patient with a tumefactive demyelinating lesion. We had one with morantic endocarditis, a narcardia abscess, inflammatory amyloid. But these are all rare, fairly esoteric etiologies, and we really want to emphasize that the vast majority of the cases in our cohort had much more common etiologies. Again, vascular etiologies, for instance, a a posterior cerebral artery territory infarct, for example. So a priori, when I used to see a splenial lesion, I, I would think of these more rare etiologies, and they do exist, and they did in our cohort. But I think a main finding from our paper is that by far, uh, it tends to be the more common etiologies. Right. And I'm taking your point too, which is, especially for those patients you found where it wasn't just one isolated splenium lesion, but there were others throughout, maybe the subcortical area or even other parts of the callosum, those are the ones where we really need to be doing secondary stroke prevention, right? Yeah, exactly. Or perhaps that this is... A retrospective study, it has limitations. But I think if you found multifocal lesions, or as Venna mentioned earlier, if the lesion is asymmetric and not centered on the midline, these are the types of features that would point you towards perhaps considering doing a little bit more workup to see if it's a vascular etiology. Right. And likewise, if there's edema in there, we really do need to step back, right? Maybe think, was the edema more predictive of malignancy? Is that what you said? Agreed. A couple of the major findings were that, you know, if if we found contrast enhancement on the scan or some kind of mass effect, that those things were markers of worse prognosis, which makes sense because they're also associated with persistent or progressive etiologies. Got it. Okay. And along those same lines, now that you are the experts on these lesions, what's your diagnostic algorithm if you get called to see a consult tomorrow and there's a splenium lesion in there? Brian, would you walk us through what is your approach to a new patient with this lesion when you're trying to figure it out and treat the cause? I want to know exactly how to do this in a in an evidence-based sort of way for the next time I get called. So context, I think, is key when you find a splenial diffusion restricting lesion. First, I start with the radiographic morphology of the lesion. You know, is it an isolated splenium lesion or are there multifocal areas of diffusion restriction elsewhere? Does the lesion have classic features of the cytotoxic lesion of the corpus callosum or clock? For instance, is it midline, symmetric? Does it have that kind of characteristic ovoid appearance? And the reason the morphology alone is important is because it has implications. We found that those with a clock morphology had less frequent readmissions within one year than those with other etiologies. So I start there. Our paper also identified several clinical and radiographic features associated with worse outcomes from splenial lesions at large. Clinically, as we mentioned, encephalopathy was associated with greater in-hospital mortality. Radiographically, the presence of either mass effect or contrast enhancement was associated with worse outcomes. So if I find any of these features, this would certainly raise my eyebrow and um, you know, prompt consideration of further workup and, and follow-up for those patients. And then finally, vascular lesions were most common in our cohort. So I think a close consideration of vascular risk factors and further diagnostics, particularly in cases where the lesion is asymmetric or had multifocal diffusion restriction. That's really helpful. Benham, do you have anything to add to that? Brian provided a very great overview. And I think really the gist of it is that, as we do all the time, uh, obtaining history, knowing what is the pretest probability for vascular process versus non-vascular process, having proper examination, and also right imaging. For example, we appreciated that actually MRI with contrast is helpful to differentiate different etiologies. And finally, uh, seeing the whole picture, 
of a patient, not just one MRI finding would be very helpful to approach these patients. Thank you, Brian and Benham. I am decidedly feeling better about the next consult I am asked to see with one of these lesions. I really appreciate that. The paper again, which has great additional details as well that we didn't cover in its entirety today, is available in neurology clinical practice. The title is Diffusion Restricted Lesions of the Splenium, Clinical Presentation, Radiographic Patterns, and Patient Outcomes. Thank you both for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.